All right, well, this is a fantastic turnout. And I think uh, we should go ahead and launch. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds for today, October the 4th. I am really delighted to introduce our speaker today. Um, our speaker is Dr. Francois Rellin, who received his MD MPH from the Emory School of Medicine and the School of Public Health in 2009. We were lucky to keep him here for internal medicine residency. I remember that joy well. Um, and then he uh, stayed and was a chief resident at Grady um, uh, in academic year 2012 through 13. After training, he slipped away from us for a second and spent three years working on Native American land in Zuni, New Mexico as part of the Indian Health Service. But fortunately, the pull of Emory was too strong and he returned in 2018 to be a faculty member, a beloved faculty member in the Division of General Internal Medicine at Grady, where he, both, where he works both inpatient and outpatient as well as in the Grady Liver Clinic. It has been a consistent sort of sadness that I was unable to recruit him to do infectious disease, although I tried. But uh, Francois is passionate about medical education and improving health equity and is part of the Medical School Dear of Faculty Committee and the Department of Medicine DEI Council. Francois notes that he wishes he could play piano and wants to spend more time watching birds, which I think are pretty noble aspirations. <laughs> So Francois, thank you so much. Um, I'm anxious to hear your talk on the use slash misuse of uh, race in medicine. All right, let's see what I can do. That looks like Zuni. Perfect, that looks perfect. There we go. Uh, okay. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Armstrong for the introduction and uh, giving me the opportunity to give this talk today. Uh, thanks to everyone on Zoom for coming to join the conversation. Um, I want to start off by thanking my partner, Jessica, who's helped me and has watched countless uh, drafts of this talk. Um, and when we get to the part about Bidil, you'll know why that's tough. Uh, and many others on the call for teaching me about medicine and race and their intersection. Uh, today, I want to interrogate the use of race in medicine and its frequent misuse. The talk is not about implicit bias or explicit bias. Um, it's also not about the overt or willful perversion of science. It's about subtle, unscientific, racialized framing that's commonly embedded in our research methods and publications. I wanna think about why this racialized framing is erroneous, why it's so durable, and most importantly, how we can avoid it going forward. Whenever I challenge race today, I'm challenging its use as an immutable, inherent characteristic that we ascribe to a person or a group of people, what's sometimes called biological race or genetic race. I'm in no way advocating for so-called color blindness or race blindness. I do wanna be clear that I believe the race is real and that it is important to continue to measure it it's, it is a way that people identify, it is a lived experience. Also, today I'm gonna to focus on the division created between white people and black people in medicine, but the greater discussion involves all racialized and minoritized people. Some important caveats to start with. Uh, I wanna acknowledge that I'm anomaly white, cisgendered, heterosexual, able-bodied male. I've directly and indirectly benefited from colonialism, white supremacy culture, and I continue to benefit from it. What I'm discussing today is my journey through this topic. Many others have been studying it for decades. Uh, the talk is based on and inspired by the work of many people, uh, most notably Dorothy Roberts, Nancy Krieger, Duana Fulwiley, Jake Hoffman, and James Baldwin. I've tried to present the topic as carefully and openly as I could. I recognize that I have biases and blind spots that I'm not even aware of. Many of you on this call know things about this that I do not, I'm open to and even hoping to learn from all of you. So we're gonna start with a little bit of history. Uh, a New England Journal paper from last month described the history of race correction and X-ray dosing in the US. The medical system routinely subjected black patients to higher doses of radiation in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s due to misconceptions about racial differences. The false belief that black people have denser bones, more muscle, thicker skin, led to higher doses of radiation. This was done without any scientific proof. And the authors of the paper describe how the ideas were taught, uh, disseminated, and made their way into textbooks. 
but the practice didn't really generate much concern until an outsider brought it to national attention. And thankfully, after advocacy led to a Senate hearing in 1968, this racialized practice ended. But the authors point out that there is nothing unique about x-rays in this respect. U.S. health professionals have frequently accepted racial logics or the belief that races were biologically different or required different treatment. Back to the present day, the reason I'm personally interested in this topic is that I see racial health inequities acting on individual patients that I take care of in clinic or on the wards almost every day. When we meet people that suffer from chronic diseases and we notice that the burden is not equally distributed, we all ask, why is this happening? How can we stop it? And unfortunately, there are many individuals suffering from this and we can see it in national statistics. The difference in mortality between those considered white people and those considered black people in the US accounts for around 202 excess black deaths per day. That's about 75,000 excess deaths per year. And for some context, in 2017, diabetes was the seventh leading cause of death in the US and it led to around 83,000 deaths. So whatever accounts for the mortality difference between white and black people in the US is almost as deadly as diabetes. That's huge, it's devastating, and we need to know what causes the inequity if we're gonna be able to stop it. We've described over and over the massive racial inequities in almost all medical outcomes. We can look at hypertension prevalence, which is important because it accounts for much of the mortality difference. These data from 2015, published by the American Cardiolo uh, College of Cardiology, showed that the prevalence of hypertension in the US is almost 50% higher and self-identified black patients compared to other ra racial categories. We can look at unequal mortality outcomes from cardiovascular disease, from stroke, from diabetes, and notice the unequal burden. Similarly, black patients suffer from higher incidence of triple negative breast cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer. And we saw from the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic that large racial inequities were happening in incidence and mortality. And the question has to, that has to follow all of these statistics is why? When we search for why, there's a troubling pattern in the way that we frame the question. If you remember in 2020, many papers were published looking into polymorphisms, um, genetic differences that could explain perhaps these higher mortality rates in African-American patients with COVID-19, looking at RAS, vitamin D, transmembrane serine protease 2. I don't even know what that is. But thankfully, this was quickly met by opposition from those who've studied racial inequities for years. They pointed out that it's not race, it's not genetic difference that causes more Black people to die from COVID-19, it's racism. So today I wanna to explore how we conceptualize race in medicine and what implications that has on the validity of our scientific conclusions. Now I wanna ask, could it be true that racism, not genetics, explains why black Americans are disproportionately dying of hypertension, diabetes, stroke, breast cancer? I think so, and I believe that science says so and has been saying so for years. I also believe that when we frame questions about racial inequities in incorrect ways, it can lead to the reification of race as some immutable natural concept that we're trying to discover. This process places at least some of the blame in the black body rather than in the differential experience of that black body in our society. So let's start with the idea that race is a social construct. We've all heard this, I hope, and we all believe it to some extent. But the question is, how does that change the way we practice medicine and conduct research? Most medical societies have some statement agreeing that race is socially constructed. You'll note the AMA published this in November 2020, so not exactly early. Many journals mention it in editorial guidance. Some papers and their limitation sections often as an afterthought. An important New England Journal article from June 2020 
called Hidden in Plain Sight, asked us all to rethink the use of, of race in clinical algorithms like the EGFR, PFTs, the VBAC calculator, and others. In the article, the authors explain that despite mounting evidence that race is not a reliable proxy for genetic difference, the belief that it is, that it is has become embedded sometimes insidiously within medical practice. Several people here at Emory, most notably Jason Cobb, have worked to remove race from the EGFR calculations, which is a great step forward, but we have many more steps to take. Dorothy Roberts has been writing about this for well over a decade. Her masterful 2011 book, um, Fatal Invention, explores the issue in depth. And in it, she says, race is not a biologic category that naturally produces health disparities because of genetic differences. Race is a political category that has staggering biologic consequences because of the impact of social inequality on people's health. Of course, there's recent pushback to this idea, especially in the lay press. This op-ed from the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal on July 26 is a great example. They claim the woke domination of higher education can seem tragically comic when it's confined to the English department. But when it infiltrates the hard sciences, far more is at stake. Read and wince how woke politics is about to infect medical education. They go on to lament that aspiring doctors will have to learn that race is a social construct, that it's a cause of health and healthcare inequities, not a risk factor for disease. And they claim without MDs or PhDs, that racial or ethnic groups do sometimes have greater propensity for certain health problems. And they bring up black women at higher risk of triple negative breast cancer. But this critique misunderstands correlation and causation, and it ignores both the history and the science of racial health inequity in the US. Let's go into detail into the myth of genetic race. The consensus among scholars is that racial distinctions fail on three counts. One, they're not genetically discrete. Two, they're not reliably measured. And three, they're not scientifically meaningful. Andrea Dayrup and Joseph Graves wrote in New England Journal in February that several scientists have demonstrated conclusively that anatomically modern humans do not have biologic races. I want to spend some time into the details of this because it helped me solidify my understanding of genetic diversity. We often conceptualize the so-called continental ancestry groups, such as Asian here um, in purple, European in green, and African in orange. And we believe they have some unique genetic core and then some overlap with other groups. Um, sometimes called admixture. And we like to think of a classic Venn diagram of genetic similarity and differences. But this is a racial essentialist way of thinking about genetic diversity in humans. The actual pattern of genetic diversity is much more like this figure. Notice first that the African population in orange has the largest circle. The continent is home to the most genetically diverse population because humans started in East Africa and stayed there almost exclusively until 80,000 years ago. And second, the genetic diversity of Asian and European populations are almost entirely contained within the African circle. Yes, there are genetic variants that are all only found in the African ancestry group, the pan-African ancestry group, and to a lesser extent in the Asian and European just outside the circle. It's important to remember that the vast majority of those differences are in non-coding DNA, where natural selection um, is not needed to limit genetic differences as it does in protein coding or promoter regions. And it's important to note that this diversity is much greater within the populations than between them. In a paper published in 2002 in the journal of Genetics, Yu et al. sequenced um, DNA samples from African, European, and Asian people and found that the average number of differences between any two individuals from Africa was greater than the average difference between an African, 
and a European or an African and an Asian person. The differences within any of these ancestry groups are greater within than between them. Another important idea is the idea that explains why human races are not plausible genetic categories is clinal variation. Clinal refers to the continuous increase, like an incline or a decline, rather than steps. This paper shows the correlation between physical distance between two populations and their genetic difference, this FST variable. And they show that genetic distance is a gradual increase. It's not categorical. Deciding where one would draw lines of separation would be completely arbitrary. And this clinal variation is hidden when we take samples and introduce clustering bias. It's important to understand that the gradual change in these traits is true for each individual trait. This is the idea of genetic non-concordance. Natural selection acts on an individual gene for the most part, unless they're extremely physically close on a chromosome and might uh, recombinate, uh, recombine together, or if they affect multiple traits, like in pleiotropy. But the clinal variation in, gene, in genetic differences exists on different axes for most of the genome. So there's a clinal variation in thousands of different dimensions. For example, skin color, is related to the amount of solar radiation and protection from folate breakdown, which could cause birth defects. And dark, so dark skin is much more common in populations that evolve near the equator in Africa, India, and Australia. But dark skin is not necessarily related to height, B12 absorption, bone density, breast cancer. And two populations with dark skins might share dark skin as a character but not even share the genetic basis for that dark skin. This is a photography project by a Brazilian artist named Angelica Das. It shows beautifully the clinal variation in skin color in people. We know that it's absurd to think of this categorically, but we dismiss the absurdity and just return to race as if it was nature. A good example of non-concordance, these are fraternal twins with different skin colors. The idea that their skin color predicts anything else in the rest of their genome is simply wrong. This slide is busy. The details don't matter as much. It's simply to show that our definitions of race continuously change. This is a graphical representation um, from the Pew Research Center of the US census categories that have changed 18 times over the 24 American censuses. And it wasn't until 20. Uh, until 2000 that you could identify with two separate races. Race is not constant over space and time, but once again, medicine has been happy to ignore this consistent inconsistency. So to recap all that, human genetic variation is real. It's very important. We need to keep studying it, but we're all of African origin. Africa is home to the largest amount of genetic variation. The majority of genetic difference is within groups, not between them. Human genetic variation is clinal, not categorical, sometimes called clines without classes. Most variation is in non-coding regions. This is what ancestry tests use. They, they find SNPs in non-coding regions that are not subject to any natural selection and can computationally tell you where maybe parts of your genome came from. Phenotypic differences do not predict other differences. This is the idea of non-concordance we discussed. And the definitions of race are not constant over space and time. So human genetic variation is important, but race has nothing to do with genetics. Genetic inherent immutable racial differences are fiction. And I do wanna caution everyone that replacing the concept of genetic race with biogeographical -ge ancestry is not a way out of this problem. Ancestry still carries many of these methodologic problems. In many ways, it too is a social construction for the reasons discussed. Races were a folk belief in human difference that were given legal power in the 1500s and 1600s, and then given pseudoscientific support in part by medicine starting in the 1700s. Races were invented before genetics. 
as Ta-Nehisi Coates wrote in Between the World and Me, race is the child of racism, not the father. If we want to study the mechanisms for racial disparities, we need to look at how race affects people's lives. If we want to look for genetic causes of disease, we can't stratify our samples by race. We need to show the sample is diverse and look for genetic causes without the racial segregation. So let's look at some of the unscientific, unscientific uses of race in contemporary medicine. So we're gonna fast forward to the near present day and talk about Bidil. I'm gonna talk about this in detail because I think it's a great example of how we frame scientific questions that involve race and how that framing leads to the incorrect conclusions. The story of Bidil begins with Jay Kahn and the VHEF trial, which was an immensely important trial published in 1986. Heart failure was more and more common, very deadly. We didn't have any way to treat people to reduce mortality at the time. And the VHEFT, the blue, blue slide on the left, compared isosorbide dinitrate hydralazine to placebo and to prazosin in patients with CHF. It did not find statistically significant improvements in mortality. It did find that prazosin was bad, right? But there was a trend towards significance. So VHEF2 was born, and it looked at enalapril, the blue line, versus isosorbide dinitrate hydralazine, the red line. Enalapril was added at this point because the consensus trial of 1987 proved that ACEs reduced mortality in heart failure. So there could not be a placebo arm. Note that VHEF2 also didn't have a combination arm. It demonstrated that enalapril was better than isosorbide dinitrate hydralazine in this population. Bidil was now 0 for 2. But that wasn't the end. Carson and Kahn published a subgroup analysis eight years later as the patent is expiring. And they showed that there were possible race-based differences on a post hoc analysis in the responses to Bidil. And this was the reasoning behind the creation of the AHEF trial. Importantly, this uh, top left here, uh, there were only 49 Black patients that received Bidil and VHEF, and only 109 in VHEF2. So AHEF was supposed to test the racialized hypothesis do Black patients respond differently to Bidil than white patients? And this slide is busy, but it shows the patient comp compositions of our three trials here. AHEFT involved over 1,000 patients. They were on decent GDMT, although none of it was proven at the time to be GDMT. Uh, and it compared placebo to hydralazine isosorbide dinitrate TID. And amazingly, it found a massive statistically significant mortality reduction and the trial was stopped early after 10 months, which is great. And the FDA approved the first ever racial drug patent. Bidil is approved for African-Americans with CHF. But what did the trial really look like? What were the patients like in these trials? I've highlighted and read some of the main differences in the patients. Importantly, AHEFT had more women. The first two trials were done in VA populations and were 100% male. So now AHEFT is only 60% male. There were more patients with diabetes, less ischemic heart disease. The patients were sicker. They were on different GDMT background. And the patients with diabetes, it turns out, were not very well balanced between the two groups so that more people in the Bidil arm had diabetes than in the placebo arm. Is it possible that AHEF patients benefited from Bidil even when they had not in the previous two trials because of these differences and not because of race? What other possible confounders did we not measure, socioeconomic or other? Um, and another corollary to this is thinking to all drug trials before the 2000s, when a drug was proven to work in 
vast majority white patients. It would get approval, FDA approval for all races. But what does it mean about the way we conceive of the inferiority of a more genetically diverse black race that a medication that works in black patients would not be assumed to work in white patients? Importantly, I'm not questioning the motivation behind AHEFT. The investigators are working to help a population that suffers from a disproportionate burden of illness. They need to be involved in studies, these patients, and they need to be cared for. I'm not suggesting that any investigator in um, AHEFT was motivated by racism or that giving Bidil to Black patients is a bad idea. Withholding it would be a bad idea given the mortality reduction. But it's important to know that the construction of the trial, the assumptions hidden a priori in the science were racializing and led to biased, unsubstantiated, racialized conclusions. If we don't acknowledge this, we will propagate the dangerous idea that race is a biological fact when it is not. Aheft claimed to test the hypothesis, does Bidil work for black patients? But it actually was built to test, does Bidil improve mortality in a group of patients with this, uh, these diseases that happen to be 100% self-identified African-American patients. The misunderstanding of AHEFT and the racializing assumptions behind it continue to cast a shadow on medical knowledge. The 2022 heart failure guidelines published in May still claim that hydro, um, hydralazine isosorbide dinitrate is mostly for self-identified African-American patients. In the text, they claim that two randomized controlled trials established the benefit in African-American. The HEFT-1, which we looked at and had a non-significant difference, so that's down to one trial, and AHEFT, which had this massive mortality reduction, but there's no reason to believe that that was because of the racial category assigned to those patients. Charles Mills, a philosopher, wrote about processes like these, and he explained that within our racial contract in our society, officially sanctioned reality is divergent from actual reality. There's an agreement to misinterpret the world with the assurance that this, st this set of mistaken perceptions will be validated by white epistemic authority. Okay, part three, p-values do not race make. Why do we get fooled by race? Why do we keep claiming that it has this predictive power? Why do we keep searching for it to be the reason why patients have different outcomes? There are recent examples everywhere in the medical literature with lung cancer, pancreatitis, asthma, prostate cancer. And there are several key errors in the methods that allow us to perpetuate this racialization. Residual confounding, the embodiment of inequality, improperly inferring causality, and gene-environment interactions. I'm going to go through a few of these. This is an example from the journal Stroke in November 2020. They looked at racial disparities in stroke incidence and mortality. And after adjusting for some risk factors, they claimed that since traditional risk factors cannot explain the remaining half of the racial disparity, the impact of biological and genetic factors warrants investigation. We like to think of it like this, seven variables associated with an outcome. And if we adjust for the bottom six here, we're left with an association between a racial category and some outcome. But this framework is wrong and forgets about other variables that we're not catching. One of the major sources is downplaying or ignoring residual confounding. It's very common to read things like we just did, that socioeconomic status is adjusted for, and then researchers can claim the remaining association might be genetic. But our adjustment methods for socioeconomic status or exposure to adversity, deprivation, are not good, and we know it. We often use zip codes to infer socioeconomic status. We use income instead of wealth. We don't have access to birth weight records. We don't ask patients about exposures to adverse childhood experiences. 
We often don't know about exposures to toxins. And not having all these factors is not the researcher's fault. A lot of times this would be too expensive, too difficult to do. But claiming that social factors were adequately adjusted for when they were not is up to the researchers to do. That is their fault. In fact, more adjustment is not always even the best way to look at these models. Race does impact outcomes. It does, throw, does so through measured and unmeasured mediators, both socioeconomic, biological pathways, but it's not an inherent characteristic in the person. Instead of this, we know that the pathways are much more complicated. So yes, self-identified race here in red in the center can be used as a proxy of risk for stroke, but it's a proxy for everything in this chart, not for genetics. And this confounding is especially problematic with race compared to other variables we use in medicine. It, this is sometimes called parallel confounding because the problem is our society uses race as a primary axis of social distinction and resource allocation, which means that race will correlate with almost all relevant environmental factors in the general population, whether they're measured or unmeasured. One helpful technique you'll see is using DAGs or causal directed acyclic graphs to theorize causal pathways and ensure that we have a hypothesis we're testing and that we control for confounders, but not mediators. And this is important because adjusting for more variables doesn't necessarily clarify a causal relationship. It can actually hide them sometimes. For example, if we adjust for income and that attenuates the relationship between race and an outcome, that means that structural racism likely acts through income to worsen the, the inequity. And just by adjusting for it, we're not interrogating how that works. And this isn't just some pie in the sky. Many of you have probably used this on the call, um, but those who've not seen it before, there's a great example from just two weeks ago published by our, some of our colleagues in the School of Public Health that use a DAG in their model to try to explain why there was a racial disparity in who was discharged home from the ER after being diagnosed with an MI. Another important methodologic error is ignoring the role of embodiment. Nancy Krieger at Harvard has written about this extensively and created what's called the eco-social model of disease. Lance Gravely calls this how race becomes biology. Duana Fulwiley describes this also from more of a sociologic perspective and talks about the molecularization of race. And I'm gonna show you an example here. This is a recent article about general population biomarker differences. They used 2,600 white and black patients from the Dallas Heart Study that were at the time, quote unquote, free of cardiovascular disease. They looked at associations between race and many of these biomarkers after adjusting for age, some risk factors, renal function, uh, and socioeconomic factors. Of note, the socioeconomic factors were self-reported, going back to what we talked about before. Also of note, this paper mentions racism zero times. The authors don't use the term genetic, but instead use the idea of racial differences in biologic pathways. That's not explicitly essentialist in the conclusions and framing, but the lack of mention of racism or the fact that race is a social construct shows that there was likely some essentialist frame in the, in the question. And it leaves it up to the reader to decide that it's not some inherent difference between races that led to these biomarker differences. Importantly, finding these biomarker differences can still be helpful and we can still intervene on biologic differences to help patients with embodied inequality. What I'm pointing out is that when we find these differences, we should be clear that the root cause of the difference is a difference in social experience, not a genetic population difference. As an example, Tanae Lewis and colleagues in the School of uh, Public Health here have documented how these biomarkers can be related to chronic stress, discrimination, those kinds of things. 
Environmental exposures affect people through biological systems. A recent review in Jack discussed the effect of air pollution on the incidence and severity of hypertension, heart failure, and other cardiovascular diseases. And because exposure to air pollution is not equally distributed in the US, on average, it affects patients differently according to racial categories. In January 2022, an article in Nature describes that in 2016, the average exposure to fine particulate matter, that PM 2.5, was 14% higher in the Black population compared to the white population. Another article recently showed that redlining, an 80-year-old racially discriminatory policy, continues to shape systemic environmental exposures and disparities in the U.S. Published in JAMA Cardiology five days ago, looking at the Ann Haines sample, researchers find that across the uh, sampling period, food insecurity was much more common in Hispanic adults and non-Hispanic Black adults compared to uh, Asian and white populations. The systemic and persistent differential exposure to air pollution, lead, waste sites, daily discrimination, police harassment, food insecurity, have consequences on biologic systems of the different racial castes in the US. But those differences, even when they're measured and we can see them, they're not inherent genetic biologic differences, they're embodied inequality. Another error is the love of the p-value. Causality in an observational study cannot be, cannot be established by having a significant p-value. When that association remains significant even after adjustment, that does not mean it was causal. It just means it's associated. And importantly with race, you cannot randomize somebody's race. So many of these are ob observational studies that are misattributing risk. I won't go into gene environment interaction, partly because I don't fully understand it, but it does fairly complicate the idea of any specific gene contributing to a risk. Genes act on organisms that live in an environment. And so having a genetic variant might only predict risk or confer protection in a certain environment, but not another. It gets very complicated, but it's another reason that we should not gloss over. So these are some of the methodologic issues that complicate all these published associations between a race, a patient's race and an outcome. And the underlying unspoken assumption that allows these errors are racial essentialism and genetic determinism that we discussed earlier. Confirmation bias blinds us to the true relationships. So why do we get fooled so easily? Everything I've said so far has been said many times, often in better ways. And the calls to end race-based medicine are not new. So why is this untruth so resilient? Dr. James McCune Smith, who was born into slavery in 1813 and then went on to become the first African-American college-educated physician. He went to Scotland to get his bachelor's and MD before coming back. He wrote, there's no reason to infer from the structure of the skeleton that there are distinctions and permanent differences between the framework of white and black races. That was in 1859. Remember that 100 years later, we were believing the opposite and using higher doses of radiation in black patients. Rebecca Lee, um, Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler was the first African-American woman physician in the US. She got her MD in 1864 and then spoke about uh, how social differences led to different outcomes when she went down to the post-Civil War South. W.E.B. Du Bois, an intellectual giant, worked to debunk racialized claims of difference. He wrote and spoke extensively about this and wrote a book in 1899 called The Philadelphia Negro, which was a sociologic study of different wards in Philadelphia and tying social factors to the incidence of disease. So why is racial medicine so hard for us to let go? There are many reasons. Part of it is that we're trying to find something to intervene on. It's a noble pursuit to help populations that are facing massive inequities. 
Another part is not wanting to admit that the massive inequities are the repercussions of political and social decisions we've made and we continue to make. If social inequality leads to diabetes, we're still gonna treat the diabetes, but the question is, what is the proper attribution of the cause in order to, to study it and end the inequity from being created in the first place? Some ask, can't we use race as a proxy for genetics for difference? Ancestry could fit in here as well. And the answer, like any proxy, is yes, we absolutely can. But we have to be clear about what it's a proxy for. When we call race a proxy, we're saying that it's standing in for other unmeasured things. And out of all those things that are unmeasured, we know that race correlates much better with unmeasured social determinants than any other genetic or biologic variable. So this is not a feel-good story about social medicine and trying to insert that and help science. It's about a scientific method question. We're choosing to ignore the fact that we're missing using race and that creates inaccurate, unscientific conclusions that perpetuate the myth of genetic race. Ann Pollock um, wrote a book in 2012, while she was at Georgia Tech um, and said, preoccupations with racial difference in medicine especially black compared to white, have remained durable not because of compelling statistics about difference, but because of the continued social reality of the conditions of unequal access to power. We're not moved by data. We're moving the data with preconceived notions. New technologies only create new fields for racialization. The Human Genome Project had an exclamation of you know, racism is done, all human races are alike, and within minutes, we found ways to racialize the genome, what some researchers call genome geography, trying to label parts of chromosomes in people. So it's not a matter of another study that can end this. We need an intentional paradigm shift. So where do we go from here? This involves all stages of medical education, research, medical practice. On Friday, I looked at what the NIH is currently funding. If you look up in the NIH reporter genetic, you can see that close to 700,000 projects related to genetics are currently funded. Around 39,000 projects related to race, 25,000 projects related to racial disparities but only 1,641 projects that are explicitly related to racism. We will have trouble getting to the root cause of racial health inequities if we don't fund it or study it. Publications can improve and journal editors are, are setting new rules. Um, JAMA published guidance in August, 2021. And they explicitly say that race and ethnicity are social constructs with limited utility in understanding medical research practice and policy. They might still be useful as a lens to view racism and disparities. I don't believe New England Journal has done this yet. And JAMA did it partly as a response to um, the podcast issue of denying structural racism. I believe we should require more training at the university level. Uh, Nicole Strand at Temple University has developed some training for IRB review of studies here on the left, and there's a webinar. Um, we held a town hall here on Zoom in April uh, on the topic and had a great discussion with many researchers. Um, but this needs to continue both in small and large groups. A group of us worked last year uh, with the Department of Medicine DEI Council, as well as the University IRB, and we changed the IRB submission application, adding three questions. If you plan to use race in your study, we asked that people define a priori what they're using as definitions for race and ethnicity, to state whether it's being used to describe or to explain inequities, and if it's 
part of the explanatory model describe how it's being conceptualized? What is it a proxy for? This is where uh, DAGs or the acyclic um, graphs could be helpful. So in conclusion, race is real, but it's a social construct, not a genetic category. We must name racism as a root cause of inequity. Race can be used to describe inequity, but it cannot be used to explain inherent differences in people. If race is found to be associated with an outcome, we must look into the mechanism by which racism, not race, leads to that association. I do believe that this is a hopeful message. Because racial inequities are entirely socially constructed, they can be entirely deconstructed to achieve health equity. Many people have understood and explained this better than I can, and some of the resources are linked here in the QR code. Thank you very much for your attention. Francois, thank you so much for that really important um, talk that you just gave. Um, incredibly thought-provoking, I think incredibly um, clear. Um, we have a question from the EUH uh, residents room um, where they're watching. So um, you, you, you made such a um, clear point about the um, vital experience um, and thinking about how we interpret established data, we make so many assumptions about the validity of published journal articles that clearly warrant additional analysis. So how do you recommend that we critically review the literature with this lens? And is there a place for a best practice update to EBM curricula or an update, honestly, to EBM guide, or to guidance overall? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, and that's a lot of what I've been trying to do myself to learn about this. I think the main practice to change is just to question any association you see. There was a JAMA article a few months ago talking about smoking cessation differences. Any mention of race should have associated with it a mention of social construction or racism. We are much better about talking about race than we are about racism when they're the same thing. And so if I see any article that mentions anything about racial differences, I go straight to the methods section. Did they define it? Um, and do they mention kind of what it's associated for, with or what they're looking at it for? Most of the time it's sort of under conceptualized. Um, and some of that is, I think researchers trying to not misspeak here. This is a very complicated, uh, a very complicated thing to, to study, to research. People don't want to misspeak. There's fears of being canceled. Um, but I think the, the information is there. Read articles by Joseph Graves. Um, and whenever you see anything published that mentions racial or race differences, make sure that they define it. And the goal is to undo that inequity and not assume that it's something inherent. Um, if anybody has a question, also feel free to raise your hand if you could unmute and ask it. Um, you know, you mentioned this a little bit in the beginning, but just to even be um, more explicit about it, um, there are uh, epidemiologists, for example, who um, are nervous that this will lead to not collecting data on at least self-identified race. And do you want to talk a little, I mean, you've uh, talked about this, but you know, um, uh, your feelings about the ongoing role or no role for, for that sort of work. Yeah, uh, this is something that's been tried by others. Um, the French who are near and dear to my heart uh, do not collect uh, racial data in a lot of their things. And I think that their reasoning for it is, is flawed. Um, I think the collection of self-identified race is extremely important. Um, and it can be used as a way to study the way racism works. But even in a sample where you're not doing that, if you are collecting a, a set of patients that are supposed to be, the goal of our research is to have a sample that is um, indicative of what's happening in the general population. You're trying to match the universe of possibilities. Uh, and if your sample is not racially as diverse 
as the population you're claiming, there are barriers. Somehow your collection sam uh, method is leading to barriers uh, to not getting the patients in. And so that has to be looked at. Um, we need to, con to have diverse samples um, in all the studies that we do. And when we do not, then that's a problematic research method. Carlos, I see your hand up. Yeah, no, great talk, Francois. I mean, I think this is really a very important topic. And, and you know, the issue is, is confusing risk factor for, for, for risk marker, right? Race should not be a risk factor. And I think it's, it's really a mistake when you start people talking about, oh, race is a risk factor for this, that, and the other. Race is a risk marker for vulnerability, for bias, for racism, for systemic disadvantage. And I think we need to really re reframe the way we look at race. We have to collect race because it's a marker we have there. And what it means, what it imp imp with the implications it has in our country, it's a marker of vulnerability, it's a marker of disadvantage. But we need to be very careful not to translate that into a risk factor. Absolutely. And you see that all over the CDC website to this day. I looked at it a couple weeks ago, but you know, they'll have black race as a risk factor for preterm labor. Um, and it's not a risk factor unless it's within a racist medical system and society. No, absolutely. No, it's it's a hundred percent true. And I, I keep on telling that to people, but researchers seem to see, be so stuck in the concept of risk factor. And, and it's not a risk factor, it's a risk marker, and you have to acknowledge that. Dr. Manning. Hey, Dr. Rollin, thank you so much uh, for this talk um, and, and it's given us so much to think about. I'd actually like to probe you as a teacher um, to help those of us who work with residents and medical students in clinical environments um, and, and see if you could just give some advice on um, when we're having clinical discussions about what to do uh, for a particular patient and um, the data available to us suggest that something is air quotes um, best for, for black patients. For example, in the management of hypertension, this works, but this has been shown to be best. Um, I, you know, while I, while I recognize these concepts that you've shared with us um, as so, um, I, I, I struggle with finding the language um, that honors our patients, that also honors the hard work of those researchers who thought about um, ways to help, frankly, people who look like me, um, to do, to have better outcomes. I'm just looking for that language. And as a teacher, when this comes up, I would love to hear uh, how you tackle the, these conversations. Thank you. Great, very good question. Very difficult uh, to answer. Absolutely, this comes up, um, you know, the all hat trial showing that HCTZ was better has, you know, Jay Kaufman has a YouTube Somewhere where he talked about some of the issues with all had and why that wasn't uh, done the best. But if thinking about the ASCVD risk calculator in the US, you click whether or not somebody is um, self identified African American or not. Uh, and that has different um, uh, treatment recommendations based on it. With hypertension, it has different treatment recommendations. Uh, I think one of the things teaching wise that's important is to separate, uh, is to individuate, I think. And, and the same, that comes up in, in a lot of um, uh, bias training and things, but individuation of the patient, not all people who self identify as black uh, are anywhere near what the people look like in those trials. Um, someone who's a recent immigrant from South Africa, recent immigrant from North Africa, grew up in Baltimore and always has. Um, those are all very different social experiences. And that, that would show some in the responses. And I, I think erring on the side of we are all more alike than different when there are drugs that supposedly work differently. This happened with hep C when we were in the liver clinic. Um, usually, uh, there's some other correlation you can kind of tease out. But I'd love to hear if anybody here has, has thoughts on that um, as well. I do not have an answer there. Dr. Dickert? You're doing my job for me. Uh, 
he you taught me he taught me cardiology years ago. Now I can teach him to unmute. <laughs> I'm very I'm 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 uh, I'm slow. You see all that gray hair. Um, so so I, oh, is that my music? Yeah. I liked it. You're good now. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> now we're back. I had to get this like my walk up music. Um, so, so, so uh, it seems to me one, one of the things that I was hoping, um, and maybe you said it and I missed it, but it, it seems to me, you know, this is an imperfect, <clears throat> there's so many ways it's an imperfect category and you've highlighted all of those. It seems to me one of the most important steps um, in all of this from a really practical level is don't stop, right? So you find some association that might be present to look deeper for the for the nature of where that uh, where, you know what might be driving it mechanistically, and then be willing to look at all the because different avenues are then going to take you into different populations and, and and looking more broadly. So I think that notion of don't stop when you find it and be satisfied with this as an explanatory variable is really critical to sort of take it to the next step to see what the drivers are. What what I want to what I'm curious about is. Um, you know the the Bidel story is fascinating, right? In part because the the where we where we've been left is a drug that, as you market as you showed, has a really pronounced um, impact in uh, the studied population within the study. So so the question I'm curious: Do you think we now need to do a trial of Bidel in non-black patients? Um. I think it'd be great as a theoretical exercise to prove that it, it in a similar population it also worked. And if we were talking about, um, you know, <clears throat> non-human animals, and we'll say let's say non-primates even, um, uh, doing that trial again might work. I think we should instead assume, I think, that a if I am a diabetic um with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy on that same background of drugs i would have to assume that it, it if i look like those patients it would also work for me uh, and so part of it we it'd be great to prove the point with another trial um but i think we i don't have any reason to believe it would not work in uh, a similar set of patients um, otherwise, what's interesting with AHEFT is that it was actually linked in, um, to a genetic, like they have a separate genetic part of it. I forget what the trial is called, but they've like continued to publish about like the, the genetic specifics of this thousand self-identified black patients to try to get at some of this stuff. And that's where you see just, I mean, there are hundreds of publications out of AHEFT um, that all assume that it is the race that is the, the the reason for the difference. It's left us in a massive quandary with regard to proliferation of new therapies, sort of where Bidel fits in because of yeah. because of the nature of the way that trial was designed. It really it, it's an incredibly difficult decision about how to use that drug. All right, I'd like to close us out with Dr. Johnson, and that'll be our last question. Hey, thanks so much, Dr. Rollin. Great job. I, I, I'd i love you just to very briefly revisit the story that you opened up with, which was this discovery that since African-Americans have thicker skin and thicker bones, that we need to use more radiation in doing their x-rays. I think that that's just a, a story that just links the false belief to the to the harm. Any Any quick comments on that one? Yeah, part of the reason um, I think it's both fascinating and horrible is that this idea of some these it really ties the folk beliefs of thicker skin, which was used in slavery, um, with um, this idea of different density of bones. This it ties right into PFTs that we're still racially correcting for, uh, the idea that the the uh, the black population has different lungs, um, different uh, different things, and we then send the medical establishment at it. Um, and in this case, the reason I, I open with it is that it most clearly caused harm um, for no reason at all. And there are things that are a lot more insidious uh, or complicated, but this is clearly you just turn the knob up to 11 
um, and harm patients based on a folk belief. There's an uh, article in 2016 um, interviewing medical students, I think in Virginia, showing that a significant portion of them believe that Black patients have thicker skin. This is still something that people believe in 2016 in medical school. Those people are doctors now, unless they failed out. On that very sobering note, Francois, I want to um, bring this to an end. Um, thank you so much. Um, I hope you have time to take a look at the chat. This has um, been incredibly um, thought provoking and um, and really a fantastic, uh, just a fantastic talk. Thank you so much, everyone. Beautiful talk. <clears throat>